Hello everyone, this is Yours Trivia, and today we're starting a brand new Let's Talk lore series titled Uniting the North, which covers the end of the Yuan clan at the hands of Cao Cao. The whole series will consist of six episodes spanning from the end of the Guandu campaign in the year 200 to the end of the Wuhan campaign in 207. And in our first episode here, titled The North, we'll first take a big picture look at why the North was important before returning to Yuan Shao's final years following his defeat at Guandu. Now, from a historical perspective, the Chinese civilization was founded along the fertile plain surrounding the Yellow River in an area collectively known as Zhongyuan, or the Central Plains. And since the founding of the first united dynasty of Qin, the term Zhongyuan has been used to represent the entire country, as it was where the majority of the population lived. And if we take a closer look at the population distribution during the height of the Western Han Dynasty, then you'll find that over 80% of the population lived north of the Huai River, which was used as the north-south divide at this time. So in essence, 80% of the population lived in the north. And in an agrarian society, population equated to production. In particular, the provinces of Sulu, Ji, Yan, Qing and Xu were all population centers, each with a recorded taxable population of over 5 million, which would add up to over 55% of the total population at this time. Now, this population trend did shift a little by the later periods of the Eastern Han Dynasty, as the continuous nomadic threats from the north, as well as the Xin Dynasty rebellion by Wang Mang, forced some of the populations to migrate south as the percentage of the population residing in the north of the Huai River dropped from roughly 80% to 60% by the late Han period. And the main beneficiaries of this migration are the provinces of Yu, Jing, Yang, and Yi, as these four provinces would also join the rank of provinces with over 5 million taxable population at the height of the Eastern Han Dynasty. And just as a frame of reference, at the height of the Eastern Han Dynasty, over 30% of the world population was living in China, amounting to over 65 million people in total. Now this number is a rough estimate, as the highest census figure done by the Han tallied a total of 56.47 million people in the year 157, but this census recorded only taxable individuals, so most scholars feel confident that the peak population of the Eastern Han should be well over 65 million at this time. But by the beginning of the Three Kingdoms period, the total population of China would actually shrink drastically to just around 22 to 23 million people, with declines across the board due to climate change, plagues, and war. Now while you might only associate climate change with modern global warming, the period of late Han was one of four mini ice ages that occurred throughout Chinese history. And this cooling led to poor harvests, harsh winters, and plagues, with smallpox and typhoid fever being the main ones during this period. And this is often cited by modern historians as a cause for the numerous rebellions and the nomadic raids during the later Han periods, as the sick and hungry turned to cult-like organizations such as the Yellow Turban, and nomadic tribes in the north attempted to migrate south when faced with the encroaching frost. And if you're curious, the four mini ice ages all coincided with the end of major dynasties as they occurred at the end of the Shang Dynasty, the Han Dynasty, the Song Dynasty, and the Ming Dynasty, which suffered a massive drop of temperature as average temperature were roughly two degrees Celsius cooler. And this massive dip in temperature which doomed the Ming Dynasty was the result of a volcanic eruption in South America as the Huanaputina explosion in 1600 in modern-day Peru was the second largest volcanic eruption ever recorded in history, leading to decades of cooling temperature across the globe. And of course, history would actually repeat itself for the Qing Dynasty as in 1883, Krakatoa erupted which was the third largest eruption ever recorded, and that would end up dooming the Qing as well. Now to be clear, climate change is one factor of many 
that contributed to the decline of certain Chinese dynasties, but it is one that is often not mentioned very much in historical books. So what does this all mean for warlords during the Three Kingdom period? Well, for one thing, with the declining population, it became clear that gaining control of more population was actually much more important than gaining control of more land, as there was an overabundance of land during this period and not enough people to work them. And with more population under your control, you not only had a bigger pool of recruitment for army, but also more production, as farming in the 3rd century was still a very labor-intensive activity, where your yield is directly related to manpower. Therefore, as Cao Cao decided his next steps, finishing off the weakened Yuan clan, who held two of the most populous provinces in the Qing and Ji provinces, became the most logical move. For if Cao Cao can absorb Yuan Shao's holdings, then he would end up holding all five of the old population centers of the Han Dynasty, giving him his most important advantage throughout the Three Kingdoms period, as if you look at the final setup of the Three Kingdoms, Cao Cao and his Kingdom of Wei would hold six population-heavy provinces, while Wu only held one in the Yang province, and Shu also held one in the Yi province, while all three kingdoms split the Jin province. In addition to population considerations, Cao Cao also couldn't risk leaving Yuan Shao unattended, as he was still the most threatening warlord at this time, despite his defeat at Guangdu. Certainly, going after the Jin province against the aging Liu Biao, or the Yang province against the teenager Sun Quan following his brother's assassination, would have been a lot easier. But entering into any prolonged war in the south not only give Yuan Shao time to recover from his defeat, but also might present him with another opportunity to strike Cao Cao while he was preoccupied in the southern front. So in the first few years following Guangdu, Cao Cao kept his focus in the north, as his only military actions south were chasing Liu Bei out of Hunan. Now, despite his victory at Guangdu, Cao Cao knew that an offensive strike against Yuan Shao would be very difficult for him. First, in terms of military strength, Cao Cao's victory at Guangdu was not without casualties. And without additional food and wealth to absorb Yuan Shao's surrendered army, Cao Cao's total army strength remained at a level less than 50,000. So invading deep into Yuan Shao's territory, where he would be outnumbered and also have to contend with an overstretched supply line, would be a non-starter. So Cao Cao waited, as he allowed his armies and supplies to rest and grow, until an opportunity finally presented itself in the year 202, when Yuan Shao would die of natural causes on May 28th. With Yuan Shao only a few years older than Cao Cao, who was 47 at this time, it was clear that Yuan Shao's health probably deteriorated quite a bit in the two years following Guangdu's defeat, as his failure weighed on his health. But just as the entire north mourned for him, a battle for inheritance was brewing between two of Yuan Shao's sons. Without officially naming an heir before his death, many within Yuan Shao's court had originally thought Yuan Tan, being the oldest son, would naturally take over his father's reign. However, being stationed in the Qing province, away from the city of Ye at the time of his father's death, Yuan Tan missed his opportunity as advisor Pang Ji and general Shen Pei forged a will stating that the inheritance shall pass to the youngest son Yuan Shang instead. Now, Pang Ji and Shen Pei did this mainly because they were worried about their own futures, as neither of them got along with Yuan Tan due to their vanity, as both of their clans were quite corrupt. Thus, both of them preferred Yuan Shang over Yuan Tan, and with the fake will and support of Yuan Shang's widow, Lady Liu, who also favored Yuan Shang, the court agreed, and Yuan Shang was officially named as Yuan Shang's heir inheriting all his titles and command of all four northern provinces. Hearing this, Yuan Tan was not shocked or surprised, nor did he suspect anything foul, as it was apparently clear that his father Yuan Shao did not like him and did not want to make him heir, or else he would have never been sent to the Qing province while keeping the youngest brother, Yuan Shang, in the Ji province. But despite accepting this result, Yuan Tan was still very bitter about it, as he ended up marching his force to the city of Liyang, just south of the capital of Ye. 
Now on paper, this move was pretty logical, as the death of Yuan Shao would certainly rekindle Cao Cao's interest in striking the north. But for Yuan Shao, his brother's deployment definitely had him worried, especially because Yuan Tan also self-proclaimed himself the title of General of the Chariot and started to demand Yuan Shao to hand him more troops so he can better defend their territory from a potential attack from Cao Cao. In response, Yuan Shao not only did not give Yuan Tan any additional troops, he ended up sending Pang Ji over to Yuan Tan's camp as an army supervisor to spy on his brother. Enraged at Yuan Shang's actions and expressing his dislike of Pang Ji, Yuan Tan continued to press Pang Ji for more reinforcements, and after being repeatedly turned down, Yuan Tan executed Pang Ji. Now, blatantly killing Pang Ji only served to confirm Yuan Shang's suspicion of Yuan Tan, as their relationship is now fractured beyond repair. But thankfully, before these brothers had a chance to turn on each other, Cao Cao would arrive, as this was the chance he had been waiting for ever since his victory at Guandu. So as Cao Cao's army crossed the Yellow River and put Liang under siege, Yuan Tan once again called for aid and reinforcement. And this time, with Cao Cao threatening the survival of their clan, Yuan Shang could not ignore his brother's request. But at the same time, Yuan Shang did not want to just give Yuan Tan more troops, as there was no way Yuan Tan would ever return them after beating Cao Cao, and it was more likely he would use them against him. So instead, Yuan Shang handed the defense of Ye over to Shen Pei, as he would personally lead their main forces south to help Yuan Tan break Cao Cao's siege. And with this, the battle for the north would officially start, as we're going to end our episode here. We'll continue next time to see if these two brothers can find a way to overcome their differences and fight together to defend the land that their father built. So hopefully you enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!